Hello and welcome to the Outskirts of Faith podcast, the podcast that is for everyone. It's conversation that's been going on for around 2,000 years, and that conversation has stemmed from the dawn of time. Let's see what's coming up on today's show. The Outskirts of Faith podcast is brought to you by Monkey Nut Audiobooks, creating audiobooks, podcasts, and voiceovers that keep people listening. So very excited because uh, we've got a bit of a spontaneous Outskirts of Faith going on today. We've just been working with Patrick Regan, OBE, who is the co-founder of Kintsugi Hope, as well as a public speaker and an author. And he has agreed to come on the podcast today after a couple of grueling days recording his audiobook, Brighter Days. But we're really delighted to have you here. Patrick, thank you so much for being here today. No problem at all. So tell us more about Kintsugi Hope. Yeah, well, kintsugi is an unusual word. It's a Japanese word. Um, it means golden joinery. So if we get a bowl and we break it, then I guess we tend to mend it with super glue. If honest, we'll probably chuck it away. But <laughs> what they do in Japan is they put a gold powder in the glue. So instead of hiding the cracks, they make a feature of the cracks. So arguably the object becomes more beautiful for being broken. It certainly becomes more unique. There isn't a bowl like it on planet Earth. And I guess the message is that beauty comes out of brokenness, that our scars are not there to be ashamed of and hidden. But actually, when we, when we own them, that something uh, beautiful can come out of them. So tell us, because um, I love that, so tell us a little bit more, what's it like on the everyday kind of vibe, what goes on at Kintsugi Hope? Well, Kintsugi Hope is really about training people to run these well-being groups in their communities. And uh, so we have a 12-week well-being program looking at you know big topics like anxiety and stigma and resilience and forgiveness. And we train churches, we train charities, we train schools to do this in their community. You know, uh, mental health is a massive issue. And often doctors are saying to us, we just don't have the ability to cope. You know, I had a doctor say to me, a young person has to be on a bridge ready to jump before I can do anything. And, and so these groups, they offer people a safe and supportive space where they're not judged, but listened to, and they can learn tools and, and just get that mutual support as well. You know, I mean, I think there's been about 10,000 people that have been through them. There's 400 uh, organizations and 1,500 leaders. So it's just been incredible. Wow. So you've um, obviously written a lot about this stuff as well, yeah. including your, your latest book, Brighter Days. Can you just tell us a bit more about that book? Yeah, Brighter Days was written for everyone, really. Everyone that wants to invest in their mental health. You know, for many of us, we might go to the gym a couple of times a week. We might watch what we eat because we know investing in our physical health is important. But we got to do, what do we do to invest in our mental health? Um, and so this book offers people loads of ideas of how they can invest in their mental health, how they can understand some of the big issues. And, and I was really hoping that people, when they read it, would feel seen, valued and heard. And, and, and even if just by reading it, they make a small change, because uh, small changes can have big consequences. It could be life-changing for so many of them. So we're really passionate about getting it out there as far as we can. Yeah, I love it. And I would strongly urge, if you're listening to this or watching this on YouTube, do go and check it out more, especially some of your talks as well, which are on YouTube, because I've watched a few of them. They're, <laughs> yeah. they're, they are brilliant. You know. You're know, quite energetic up there. Yeah, I, yeah. I love it. I, I love connecting with people and I really enjoy um uh, just trying to not just connect with people's heads, but connect with their hearts as well. And, and just, you know, trying to have that, that when you have that connection point, isn't it? It's, it's amazing. It's incredible. I remember when you were talking to me about resilience and you said for you personally, three things which are really important are friends, family, and your faith. And we're talking outskirts of faith now. And I'm, I'm curious, I always ask this question, have you ever found yourself on the outskirts of faith? And what did that look like and what sort of brought you back to, to, to your faith? And, and if you haven't, you know, have you witnessed that in other people? Yeah, I don't know if I feel like sometimes I live on the outskirts of faith. Um, I don't know if that's even allowed. That, but, that's, uh, allowed. that's allowed. <laughs> but, um, Many people are listening going, that's allowed. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I kind of realized that faith and doubt are, are very similar to me. You know, the people who worry me are the people that have no doubt about their faith. So I always say to people that, you know, the the um, people who flew the planes into the Twin Towers, mm. they had no doubt that their faith compelled them to do it. And throughout history, we've seen even with the history of the Crusades or the slave trade, there's been, like, been no doubt. 
And and I think doubt is actually a really healthy thing because um, it makes us question and makes us answer. And and I guess for me, I've always been really passionate about the personal Jesus. I find it just so inspirational. Just like I read a book years ago uh, by Philip Yancey called The Jesus I Never Knew. And suddenly I just realized that the Jesus I grew up in Sunday school was very different to the Jesus that he was describing. Mm. And at the end, but then sometimes within church culture, um, I've struggled a bit, you know, and I found it hard to to feel like I'm fitting in and I feel like I'm the odd one out. I feel like I'm not spiritual enough or academic enough to process this culture. But what I really firmly believe is that faith for me is about realizing that God is present in every season of your life. Mm. Um, I've struggled a lot with my mental health. And people that struggle with mental health in church sometimes can be told, well, it's because you're not praying enough or you've got some hidden sin in your life. Or, um, you know, I felt ashamed about going to the doctors because people have said to me, well, you know, you can't go to doctors about your mental health. Whatever would you think? of? Why would you do that? You know, need to trust God more. And <laughs> I was just like, I'm smashed to pieces, mate. I'm like, I need to do anything. And and so over the years, uh, I'm not on the outskirts of faith in the sense I think I'm my faith is probably different. It's authentic. Um, I hope it's real, but still have lots of questions. It's not black and white. I'm I'm loving that you said that because and if you listen to this, what you've just heard is really really important because you do find in some place and it, and it works for some Christians. It does work where they they need that guidance. They need that that help. But it's important to question because it's about a relationship, you know. And I don't know about you, but all of my relationships with the different people, my friends, my family, they're all different, you know. Mm. You have your unique relationship. You've got to find what that relationship is with God, with Jesus, you know. And it's great you say it's inspirational. Um it it really it really really is. But also, it worries me a bit when when I'm hearing, you know, that people say, right, you have to do it this way. You have to do it that way. You know, there is guidance. But I wonder if you'd agree with me that you're saying about praying harder, you see. And, you know, I, I just think, I, I think people need to understand what prayer is. And it's different. Again, it's different for everyone, isn't it? Mm. It's like some people, it's like, you know, they, their hands are together and you're, you're doing that kind of vibe. Um, and some people lying on the bed go, why? Why? Why me? You know, you just let it all out. It's your own personal relationship. But I find that within prayer, God won't say, well, there's the answer. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. But ways do get revealed to you. So do you feel that maybe, like especially going to your book, that we need to get ourselves in a better place so we can, within our prayers, suddenly become aware of the answers and the op- op- options and opportunities that are coming to us through God? Yeah, I think it's about um, sort of engaging with the presence of God where you're at, really. There was a, as a, a guy called Brother Lawrence who wrote a book, which has sold millions, I think, um, called Practicing the Presence of God. And, mm. and he made this point that prayer and those sort of things was less about, I guess, the holy quiet time which if you don't tick that box at the beginning of the day, then you, you know, if you don't manage it, you feel guilty. And you think, oh no, I'm going to have a bad day now. I didn't do the the holy half an hour. And, and that's not saying that praying for half an hour is a bad thing. Of course it isn't. Um, it can only do good. But actually doing it out of a legalistic uh, duty sense that I'm just ticking the box. And, and actually I think it's going, you know, I mean, I used to think uh, growing up that it was my job to take God everywhere. You know, I've traveled to 50 different countries. I've traveled all across the UK. And then I just got tired and exhausted trying to do that. And I realized that God's already there. Mm. And that actually I need to spot what he's doing and join in and start to engage in the presence of God is going, well, maybe I can experience God on the underground, on the tube, in universities, in um, schools, well, no doubt, amongst yeah. the homeless uh, there underneath Waterloo Bridge. And and everyone's an image bearer, right? So it says we're all made in the image of God. And so often we focus on sin, and I can understand why people do that, or bad things we've done wrong. But actually creation started with God going, it's good. And man and woman, really good. So it started, I like to think about more of original goodness than of original sin, because it sensed that I want to draw that goodness out. You're made in the image of God. And then, and what happens is, is through like, 
craziness of life sometimes, that image that gets damaged and destroyed and, and, uh, and, and but you can still see it in people and you're like, what does it mean to draw that out so yeah. people realise that they're loved? And I think prayer is putting yourself in that place where wherever you are, you've almost got a consciousness that God is with you. Yeah, I always say that it doesn't matter what place you are. And my listeners here, they're going to be going, uh, all right, he's going to say it. And I'm going to say it. My favorite quote, Jesus loves the gutter. You know, I, I, I recorded this book once and, uh, you know, and the reason why I love that so much is because for me, it doesn't matter where you are at any time in your life. You know, there is a door for you, you know. But I always say there's a little little flame within, every, within everyone, a little flame no matter who mm. you are, where you are. And it all boils down to what kind of fuel you put on that, mm. you know, um, which I think is great. But also, you're right, you know, some people do like the Holy 30, like you said, and all that kind of thing. But everyone, I say it again, you know, everyone has got their their own journey. Everyone is unique. Everyone has their own relationship, you know, and that one doesn't suit all, does it? No, and I think it's a really important question to ask is, you know, for all of us, what does success look like? And... Uh, and I go back to the Old Testament story where um, Jesse was looking to anoint David, you know, and obviously all the other brothers are there and they're probably a lot more impressive, a lot stronger, better looking, probably more, you know, intelligent. And David was the one who got it. And, and but there was a verse that says that everyone else looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. And, and I was thinking actually success, I think, is living by your values because your values are your priorities in life. They're the things that matter the most to you. So if you're not living by your values, you know, integrity, honesty. I, I've known so many people who've earned a serious amount of money, two cars, massive house. And I'll say to them, what's your number one value? And they go, family, relationship. And I go, how's that working out for you? Well, I never see them. I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. And so I said, would you say that you're successful or not? And they'd go, not successful. I'm as lonely as hell. I'd never see my kids. And so actually challenging ourselves are going, what is the most important thing? What are our priorities? Are we living to those? And if we do, that's when content and happiness actually comes. Yeah, I think you've absolutely nailed it there. You see, and there's some people who, let's just say those kind of hardcore people who would say, oh, you know, what well, well, the number one thing is, you know, God, you know, they'll go bang. And yeah. I get that. But then I, you know, I would say to myself, to the listeners, and, you know, maybe some people write into me on this one, but I'd be like, well, you know, you know what I mean? What does God want for me? You know, what what does God want, you know, for our, for our, for our happiness, for our learning, you know, what do you want for your kids? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I think that's a really, really important message, what you just said there. And I'm going to think on that and I'm going to bring that up again sometime. <laughs> Thank you. I think that's great. Ask yourself that question, guys. Write in. Uh, write in. If you're on YouTube, write it in the, the comments below. Really interested to know what you've got to say about that. Um, I've asked you to bring a bit of scripture with you today. Um, and I'm guessing you're going to pull this out at the top of your head. Some people have phones, iPads, bits of paper. But uh, what, what did you bring and what does it mean to you? Well, I guess the, the scripture I was thinking of was Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans that give you future and a hope. And it's one of those verses that you see on T-shirts, you see on um, fridge magnets. It's, like, it's, it's great. You know, God wants to give us a future and a hope. But the challenge with that is when I started thinking about it, I was like, what does hope really mean? And, and of course, this passage is written to a bunch of people who are in exile. They basically come from Jerusalem, come from Israel. They've been marched across the desert into a place called Babylon. And then just before this verse happens, that someone prophesies and goes, you're in exile, means, you know, you can't worship your gods. There's no Levitical sacrifices. Um, you've got to learn, um, you know, do everything the Babylonians told you. You need to live by a different set of values. They felt lost. They felt vulnerable. They felt orphaned. In fact, the book of Lamentations is all about how they felt. It's the most quite depressing book. It's just all their sadness and grief coming out. And, and then Hananiah comes along and goes, guys, it's okay. It's going to be over in two years. And then Jeremiah has to come along and go, you know what? It's not two years. That was a false prophecy. It's 80 years. 80 years we're going to be in this situation. But within those 80 years, 
I've still got plans to prosper you. I've still got plans to give you a future and a hope. And I think that makes it even more powerful. Yeah, yeah. Because it's basically saying, guys, life is uncertain. It's tough and it's going to be tough for a very long time. And I think that's realistic. I think looking at our society, looking at what we're going through, looking at climate change, looking at the cost of living crisis, looking at um, post-COVID and the war in Europe, life is going to be a bit tough. We need to just be real and accept that. But within that time, God says, I give you hope. Right. I want to stop you there, okay? Because you have joined together two things here and you'll see why. Because I'm going to not only do the scripture bit, but I'm also going to do this. What What does it mean? I really don't have a clue. Because the word I was going to give you today was hope. Oh, there you go. Okay, so so the word you've got, so we always ask you, you there's a hope and it's random that you've just chosen that, so I'm going to run with this. So keep keep going. Let's just talk. Let's dive into hope more and more. I'm loving it. I'm going to sit back, educate me. I'm loving this. Go. Well, I think people need hope. I think Brené Brown Brown says this. People need hope the way they need air. And I think the thing about hope is it isn't just like a feeling. It's a way of thinking. And uh, so, you know, people will say, are you a glass half full or half empty person? Now, I am definitely a half empty person. (laughs) My wife is definitely a half full person. You know, I'm just thankful we got a glass in the first place. You know, it's like, um, but I've realized that actually hope for me isn't ignoring the bad stuff, but realizing that there's a way of focusing on something that's happening, that's growing. So I would say, you know, if you go outside, you walk along, you'll see these grey, lifeless concrete slabs looking at you if you look down. And if you look closer, you'll find wherever there's a small crack, then basically the grass is straining to get through towards the light. Mm. And you can bend down and you can take that grass away, but you won't take away its root. Eventually, that grass will always crack the concrete. And I guess that's come the way I've started thinking about hope, that hope isn't ignoring the grey, lifeless stuff that's going on. That's reality. We need to share in that for people. But it's always saying there's grass growing through the cracks. There's grass straining to get the forward and, and it will never go. And, uh, and that's why I think, you know, I've often talked about in the Bible about hope being steadfast and certain because it's always going to be there. Let's talk more about the scripture you were talking about there. Just, just, keep, just keep elaborating. So we've got the 80 years. You know, it's going to be yeah. 80 years. Yeah. But within that, there's hope. Let's just just, can you dive into that a bit more for me? Yeah, well, of course, um, 80 years, that's pretty hard to hear, right? Right. I mean, Hananiah's prophecy of two years, much nicer. (laughs) So like Jeremiah comes in this. But I think the interesting thing about this is this is a time not to be wasted. I I love that. I love the fact that nothing is wasted in God's kingdom. Mm. And even the hard stuff of our lives is not to be wasted. And of course, then in Jeremiah, he starts talking about, well, you know what, guys? Don't run away. Plant gardens. Settle down. Um, And then it says, pray for the peace and prosperity of the city because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So it's like, you're here. You're not leaving. I'm going to bless you in this place. And actually, you're going to be a blessing to the people around you as well. Mm. And, And I think that's an amazing thing. And I think like when you start to start thinking like that, and I think the thing for me about hope is that a lot of people I talk to, they're very pessimistic about, I guess, the end of the world, you know, you listen to them and go, well, you know, the world's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And then one day all the Christians were going to get raptured out of it and and then it'll be destroyed and it'll be Armageddon and it's just, it's just doom and gloom. Mm. And I'm like, I can't get passionate about that. No. You know, I am not going to hang around on earth, wait until I die um, or get ripped out of the place. Um, I want to partner with God in bringing restoration in the here and now. And I think so much of scripture is actually about this incredible narrative um, around creating a new heaven and a new earth. So everything gets restored. Um, Revelation 21, there'll be no more death nor pain. He will wipe every tear from their eye. And it's like, wow, if he's recreating heaven and earth, that means the choices I make now about the environment matter. Yeah, yeah, Because it isn't going to get kicked into touch at the end of time. Poverty matters. Relationship matters. And not only that, I get to partner and be part of bringing that new recreation. And that's got to be exciting rather than sort of saying, that's it, we're out of here. Yeah, there's stuff on, um, especially on social, like Insta and stuff like that at the moment. And there are loads of videos and they're just going on about Revelation. 
Yeah. They're mm-hmm. going on going, well, Revelation said that this river would dry up and, you know, and there's only four drops left before. And, and I'm like, okay, all right. So you found some things which are linking together there. Okay, fine. What do you want me to do with that? Yeah. What, what, do, what, what do you want me to do? There's no call to action with that. What do you want me to do? Oh, you want me to drop down on my knees and say, oh, oh, oh God, I'm sorry, you know, because I am, you know, I do, I'm a sinner, you know, I do loads, you know, loads of stuff wrong, right? But, you know, I, I would much rather you know, live in hope. And I'd much rather do the best I can on, on, a day, on a daily basis. Now, the whole point, Patrick, of this, what does it mean? Is that there are words which pop up in Christian chat, which might put people off, you know. And there are people who are like wanting to meet Jesus and wanting to have a, a bigger relationship with God. But, you know, there's a lot of words and you hear people talk and it could be a bit of a put off, you know, some of these words. But there are going to be people going, well, I just don't feel there's any hope. I can't. I, I can't. I, I, I wake up in the morning and I'm like, I, and I try. I really do try. But you know what? It's just bloody difficult right now. I don't feel hope. What, what would you say to those, those people? What, what's, a, what's a step those people can do? Um, well, I think, you know, I've felt like that myself. And... Uh, and I know my my family have as well. In fact, I remember there was a time after I'd gone through major limb reconstruction surgery and uh, Diane, my wife, um, she just felt this is just too hard. The life is hopeless. Like once he's had this leg done, he needs to get this leg done and everything around us was going wrong. Dad had cancer. Kids were sick. It was like a perfect storm. And I remember Diane said um, she went into her bedroom it's my bedroom as well. <laughs> and she said, I just can't do this anymore. Mm. And you know, they're saying there's that light at the end of the tunnel. It was almost like, I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel's too long. I can't see anything. And she, I guess she just had a sense. Um, Stop looking for light at the end of the tunnel and look up. And you will see uh, some pinpricks and the light is bursting through. And it's the love of your family. It's the love of your friends. It's the love of your community. It's those things are put inside of you. Just concentrate on those. And I remember she said to me, Patchy, I think that we just need to like get through the next hour. And then after that, we're going to get through the next hour. And then we're going to get through the next day. And we're going to do it together. And we're going to do it with our faith. And, and I've always said, I think one of the most powerful things you can say about faith is when I chose to become a Christian, it was the last choice I made on my own up to that point. That was it. Now, from any other choice I make on my own, uh, I, I don't make on my own. I, I, I have someone who will be with me, you know, and uh, through the good times and through the bad. And and I don't know all the academic answers to all the questions around Christianity, but what I do know is that everything I face from now on, I'm not on my own. Patrick, I feel like at this point, I think a lot of people are going to hear that going, yeah, yeah. You do a lot of talks about this, about... Um, you know, you do a lot of talk about Bright Days, for example. I want to do a shout out because I've just recorded the book at Monkey. Just had to I listen really like to it. it for two days. Yeah. <laughs> which I've loved, which I've loved. But, you know, wh- how can people find you talking like this a bit more? Just, out, just, just to put a plug in for you because I think people should. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've got loads of stuff on YouTube. And uh, during the pandemic, I did this whole little... 12 minute sermon series um, for churches all over the UK, which seem to go really, really well. And uh, so they've just stayed there now and people are using them for all sorts of other things as well. But obviously there's the books and that uh, as well. And and we often tour around the UK. How do they um, find out about that? Yeah, go to the website, www.kintsugi, which is K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, hope.com. And you were literally, there's there's 10 shows coming up in October, November. I'll be there. Um, that would be great. I'll be there, they're, man. They're absolutely. such yeah. fun. I absolutely yeah. love doing it. You meet the most incredible people and have the most incredible conversations. So, um, yes, yeah, that's probably my favorite thing to do in the world. Um, yeah. They're not like, um, they're great music, great conversation, really laid back, lots of fun. And uh, yeah, bring that's your great. mates to them. A question I love to ask is, where have you personally seen God working recently? I think where I've seen God work um, most recently is is probably in Abigail, my daughter's life. I think she um, she's coming up to 15 now, but 
Abby has special complex needs. She has um, ADHD. She has autism. She also has something called nystagmus, which means she has 40% vision. And it's really hard when you have to sit down and tell your daughter that she's going to have a disability that's going to affect her for the rest of her life. Mm. And I know she's, you know, because of all the challenges, she's not going to get a GCSE um, probably in the same way that all her friends are. But she has incredible empathy and incredible kindness, um, more than what I see in mature adults a lot of the time. And just recently, she, despite all her obstacles, and she has more than most, um, she auditioned to be in Matilda, she's Mrs. Wormwood, and <laughs> uh, and she got through it, and she was brilliant. And then she auditioned for this other thing with like a, uh, um, for people that go and act on TV adverts and in in films and stuff, and she got through that as well. And I just see when she just she's always willing just to put that one step forward. And I think as she puts that one step forward, you know, God just comes and and Abby does things that I will never be able to do. I'm quite jealous of her in some ways. It's like she's amazing. Uh, she still has her challenges. You know, if she was here, she goes, yeah, I had a meltdown last night and this still happened. And so I'm not painting her as an angel. But I've just recently just been looking at her and going, yeah, that's incredible. And uh, I can really see God working in your life. And uh is a beautiful thing. I've seen a bit of a pattern there. And thank you so much for sharing that story. It's a great story. Um, with the pattern with you saying about one thing, then the next thing, and then that let's just get through the next hour and then the next hour. And maybe people are just looking too far in advance and just complicating things for themselves, you know. But I I, I love that. I'm, I'm I think I'm gonna think on that for a little while because that's yeah I think it's true stop being so thought provoking (laughs) no no I was just saying but I think the interesting thing isn't it (laughs) around like I guess we're talking about being more mindful of where we're at in some ways but and I think one of the challenges with that is is that a lot of us we spend so much time in the past thinking about the past and regrets and and then or we spend so much time in the future thinking about, oh my goodness, what about the future? What's that going to look like? And, you know, vision is important and all that sort of stuff, but we just lose out on the present so much yeah, because we're never fully present. And and I think that's a that's a real skill, actually, to to be still, you know, and think to, you know, we've either got our phones, we've got this, we've got that, always distracted. And, and actually, can we handle being still with ourselves? Can we handle that 10 minutes of doing nothing or actually do we freak out and we need to find something to distract us because then we're not really being mindful and looking at ourselves in, in a healthy way. I was, uh, you might find this interesting. I was producing a Buddhist recently and we got talking and it was actually a book. I can't remember, something of the sun, something rules of the sun or something. I found it a really interesting book. And basically there's a news journalist and they went and spent some time um, with a Buddhist and who, as as it was described, is quite high in enlightenment, mm-hmm. as it's described. And they sat down under a tree and just had their first conversation, sat down under a tree. And they had an orange each. And they were eating that orange. And by the time the journalist had eaten the whole of his orange, the Buddhist was eating his first segment of the orange still. And he went, oh, you're, you're taking your time. He goes, no, it's not. I'm appreciating this orange right now. He says, you've just kind of like wolfed yours down. Yours is gone now. But he concentrated on every single bit. And I actually put, I took a lot from that. Mm-hmm. And I put it into my practice now where sometimes, and you know, you know, you know what it's like, you know, you're running multiple things and doing talks and stuff like that. That basically you can get quite stretched. So, and I'm thinking about yesterday and tomorrow and next year and last year. So what I now do is I sort of like if I was here now, I'd be thinking to myself, right, I'm talking to Patrick. Patrick's has got white trainers on, you know, the microphone. Oh, if I set up again, I'd probably put a fraction lower, you know. And then, <laughs> and then what, what I'm doing is I'm suddenly bringing myself back in the room. Mm. And I think it's a really great practice because I think, I would say, majority live either side mm. of the now. Do you agree with that? Yeah, no, totally. I think it's huge. I often think actually the story of Mary and Martha in the Bible is a really interesting one because, again, um, what people often miss about that story is that Jesus um, is in the male's room. So those houses were divided into male and female. Um, and so Mary's problem, sorry, Martha's problem with Mary is not that she's sitting down like doing nothing. She's in the male room. She's behaving like a bloke. 
Um, but it was for, for, for Mary, it was like, I just need to be present to what Jesus is saying right now. And that's more important. And actually, Martha, who gets in the neck a lot of the time, she was the one who invited Jesus in in the first place. Mm. She was the one who took the risk. And, and she's probably thinking, what on earth? But she's like, no, nah, I just have to be in that place because I know that what he's saying could be life-changing. There's a great book on that. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Amy Bouchapai. Oh, yeah. You know Amy, yeah? Yeah. And um, she wrote a great book um, called Transforming Love. And it's, it's based around that. Oh, great. Um, and if you, if you just took something from what Patrick said, uh, go and get it or get the audio book. <laughs> the audio book sounds great. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, we did that one. Um, but uh, Amy's great. She's on, on the podcast as well. She's, great. she's, she's fantastic. It's, it's such a great way of speaking. And I, I love how she, because she opened my eyes to that story. Yeah. Because if I'm honest with you, I kind of brushed over it. Yeah. I won't lie to you. And, yeah. you know, that's okay. You don't need to know every bit of scripture, but I do. There's stuff that stands out to you, but it got me thinking. Yeah. And that's why I, I love doing this, you know, just hearing people speak. Okay, let's move on. It's now time for Splat the Nat. Yes, it is time for Splat the Nat. Um, so Splat the Nat. So basically the whole point of this, just speaking quickly, uh, because the listeners are going, Elliot, you say it every time, but I do. So basically there is a lot that can stop us in the world. Some people call it evil. Some people call it darkness, the Satan, evil one, trauma. It could be anything. Just put any old label on it. Um, but basically there's a little thing that can just like float around in front of you a bit like a gnat and you swat it out the way and try and get on but for some reason that gnat flies back in front of you and it you know it goes off again and it flies back in the end you're standing up giving so much energy to this little gnat where I'm saying let's just splat the gnat in the name of Jesus and then we can pass that problem to God now God doesn't take it away but at least you know you've got someone to deal with with it with. So I've had so many different answers to this, you know, so many different answers. Um, some of them quite funny, some of them very, very serious. But I'm wondering, what gnat would you like to splat in the name of Jesus? Arsenal fans. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> no. All right. I feel like I need to address the camera right now. I just want to make it quite clear that, uh, the Ars Ar you know, Arsenal, very, God very Arsenal nice. Fans. God loves Arsenal fans. No. And uh, there are other football teams as well available. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess, um, I guess the inner critic. I think I've always struggled with my inner critic. He's, he's a top and, uh, fan. <laughs> Put did it you, out there now. Did I? No, well, I'm I think, just, just, I think just, people might work that out. I've just fair. ruined your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I think people might work. Oh, but no, seriously, I think I think probably the inner critic is something that I need to um, splat quite regularly because I think that, that it comes flying around quite regularly, and uh, and I think you do that like you say by listening to an alternative voice because the inner critic is the loud voice, but actually there's always an alternative voice, and sometimes the way you splat that net is you listen to the alternative voice. Love that. That is splatted and a nice to the point answer. So well done. Okay, so before we kind of uh, get near the end, um, I'd like to do a little kind of three question quiz. Okay. All right. So it's just three questions sort of from the Bible and uh, some people get them right. Some people don't get them right. Sometimes it's nice, easy questions. Sometimes like what I said to Paul Krenzer, how many verses are there in uh, in the Bible? And it's just like, wow. You know, so it's, fun. it's just fun. It's a little bit of learning we can all do together. I will ask you the question. You'll hear a little bit of music. Okay, and then don't answer until the music's finished so it sounds more dramatic. So, are you ready for your three-second quiz? Yeah. Your three-question quiz, should I say. Okay. <laughs> That's just like, oh. you didn't tell me about this, <laughs> Elia. Okay. All right. What is the shortest verse in the Bible? So there it is. What is the shortest verse... In the Bible, Patrick. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, of course, for, for Lazarus, um, if you want to go and check that out more, that's in John chapter 11, verses 35 to 45. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. I love, I love it how, you, you know, how things are phrased. Behold how he loved him. I, I, I like that. It's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, when we when we think of uh, when we think of Jesus, what um, well when when you sort of like read the New Testament or you you watch the Chosen or, or dive into that sort of thing, you get a, a bigger picture. But I think 
for people just maybe on the outskirts or looking at them for the first time, you often think of the cross and you know, you think of the, the the pins, you know, the nails and stuff, and of course the um the thorns on his head. So my question number two is quite simply, who gave Jesus a crown made of thorns? Who gave Jesus a crown made of thorns? Is it the soldiers? Yeah, a Roman, a Roman soldier. Oh, sorry, uh, have another one. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you, live studio audience. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, could you? I, I remember watching. Um, oh, what's the Mel Gibson one? Passion of Christ. Yeah, and I remember watching that bit, and I just I churned in my stomach. Yeah, could you just imagine going through that much? You know, having someone love you so much that they know they have to go through that, and then that's just like one little fraction of it. Well, goodness me! But uh, yeah, a Roman soldier. Okay, so I reckon we're going for a three out of three here. Okay, three out of three. For your final question. What problem did Bartimaeus have that Jesus fixed? Oh, he looks confident. Hey, Jimmy, looks very, very confident here. What problem did Bartimaeus have that Jesus fixed? He was blind. He was blind! <laughs> three out of three. Um... I, I'm going I'm to read this, if I may. So, I've got here, I think this is from... Uh, Matthew 20, verses 29 to 34, or it might be the one from Luke, I'm not sure. So it goes, um, uh, Jesus and his disciples went to Jericho, and as they were leaving, they were followed by a large crowd. A blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of, is this Timaeus? I always get this wrong, Timaeus, Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When he heard that it was Jesus from Nazareth, he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. Many people told the man to stop, but he shouted even louder, Son of David, have pity on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him over. They called out to the blind man and said, don't be afraid, come on, he is calling for you. I love that, don't be afraid, come on, get over here. The man threw off his coat as he jumped up and ran to Jesus. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? Did he not know what he wanted to do for him? Well, I'm, I'm just reading the scripture. Here. So, <laughs> so I know, I think I know what your point is, but go on. Well, I, I just think it's incredible because here you have a blind beggar who is basically an undesirable, a pain in the neck. He's seen actually cursed by God, um, obviously blind. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you have the son of God, the maker of all the universe, asking a blind beggar, an undesirable, what do you want me to do for you? I mean, surely he knew he was blind. Well, of course. It was like, what did he expect him to say? I've got a headache or something like that. But then when you think about it, yeah, go on. it's actually, it's incredible because by asking him the question, he gives him dignity. And he's saying, I'm here to listen. He doesn't assume. You know, how many times do people go up um, in a wheelchair for prayer and people could just start praying for them, assuming that's what they want prayer for? Yes. And so it's yes. just it's incredible. I think this is one of my favorite stories. And uh, I think it's incredible that Jesus goes, well, how can I serve you? Yes. How can I love you? Yes. How can I listen to you? What is it you want me to do for you? Exactly, exactly. That was exactly the point I was, I was going to. So thank you so much because you phrased that so much better than me. But also he gave the man the opportunity to show his faith, mm. you know, which, which is great. I mean, it, it says here, um, the blind man answered, master, I want to see. So straight away, his master, I, you know, I have faith. As we say, master, you are, you are the son of God, you have faith. Jesus told him, you may go, your eyes are healed because of your faith. So I, I love everything you just said, because this weren't the whole point. And that's why I wanted to read it, because Jesus isn't just someone who's going up going, heal, heal, heal. You know, it wasn't mm. that at all. It wasn't an easy road for Jesus at all. But Jesus gave people the opportunity to come to him. And, and, was, and I think for me, I wonder if you'd agree, when I think of Jesus, I think Jesus had the beautiful ability, which I don't have. I try to, and I, I try to make myself have it, and that is to pause mm. and listen, mm. you know? And sometimes I do it here when I'm interviewing you. I want to wrap it on. Mm. But you, when you interview, as you well know, you have to like, you, you, you know this feeling, you want to say something, but you're like, uh, just shut up and let me speak. <laughs> yeah. Shut up and let me speak, you know? I've also noticed as well that because I'm speaking to, because I'm originally from South End, 
I've noticed that my Essex is coming out more oh, speaking to you. Good. I've noticed very that, cool. yeah. It's like when I speak to my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or my brother. But, you know, you mentioned that, um, Elliot, Jesus Jesus wept. I, I often thought that about the, that passage as well. Why did Jesus weep? Surely he's the son of God. He knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Like He probably had an inkling that might happen. Um, but it was almost, I reckon that as he was there, it says Jesus wept. Everyone around him is in tears. Um, it's heartbroken. And it's almost like their pain moved him to weep. He was identifying with the pain of Mary and Martha and the pain of the whole situation. He could have just swept in there and went, guys, it's fine. <laughs> just just hang on a minute. It's all going to be good. Put the kettle on, be back in five. <laughs> you know, it's like, seriously, this is all, this is, doesn't have to happen like this. But there was a sense where Jesus was so compassionate to the feelings and the culture around him that he wept. Or he said, what do you want me to do for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think other people would talk about the the human element of mm. Jesus there as well. Yeah, they, 100%. They? Um, honestly, I, I, I've, I've had this chat with you and I think the story is the same for a lot of people. So for myself, uh, I grew up very much kind of living my life spirit-led. I always felt like I had a relationship with God, always believed in Jesus. My relationship with Jesus came later. Mm. That, that's what happened mm. when when I decided I want to have a relationship. And it certainly felt like Jesus was kind of like waiting, you know, patiently um, and having that. But when you, but I do urge you just, just explore a little bit, just these couple of little passages here, just look into them a bit more because, and just start, pick up Mark, pick up Mark. I'm, I'm also thinking of, uh, uh, there's a bloke called Tom Wright and he did a new translation of the New Testament recently called uh, New Testament for Everyone. You know, go and get a copy and just look through Mark and and just get an understanding of what Jesus is like. It's just really cool. Like, it's just a cool, loving bloke. And I love that. I love the way you say it. There's just a bloke called Tom Wright. Um, he's quite an intelligent bloke, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, well you know, it's really funny because... Uh, do you, hear his, um, do you hear his audio as well? Yeah, yeah. So we, we were down, um, I did that on location. Nice. And I remember he was saying, uh, oh, we're down in Oxford. It's like, Elliot, we're going to do it in this, uh, um, this the, the room, you know, this, this office. And, you know, it's, it's fine to record, it's quiet. And I went in there and it was like one of these old buildings and everything was echoing. <laughs> and I had a lot of sound treatment in the car. I was like, right, set it up. <laughs> Luckily, I went down the night before. I went, drove back to the studio, got loads of gear. I had theatre curtains. Up. I just, anything I had was like, bang. But it was great. And do you know something? Um, he, the reason why Tom was so amazing is because he's intelligent. Everyone yeah. knows this. You yeah. know, people, some people know him as NT, right? Don't they? Yeah. He's incredibly intelligent and that level stuff. But he just doesn't make you feel like that. He doesn't. Yeah, 100%. And when he was speaking, um, when he was speaking about things, it's so, it, I just felt so humbled. And what, But for me, I walked away hearing passages from the Bible, what it felt like for the first time. Because mm. he said stuff, but he had such a clear understanding mm. that the way he phrased it made me think, I, I, I didn't realize. Mm. You know, you know when um, the denial of knowing Jesus for three times, mm. I, I, I went back, I felt really upset. Mm. Uh, but the way he said it, I went away and I did think to myself, how much do I deny? You know, mm -hmm. and how many times should I do the right thing? And I know it's the right thing, but I choose the other path. Mm. And I deny, you know. Um, but yeah, so, so Tom Wright, you know, Check him out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, incred incredible bloke. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's something I've always wanted to do. Um, uh, and that's someone else I've worked with, uh, John Lennox. Yeah, I've always wanted to put them in a room together. Yeah. And just see be, what happens. Be a fly on the wall. <laughs> yeah, be a fly on the wall. And I wouldn't even dare start joining the conversation because they'll just look at me and go, all right, let, let's humor him. Okay. <laughs> um, Patrick, I... Please come back another time, even if I have to come to you. I, I think the, what you talk about is great. I think what you're doing at Kintsugi Hope is fantastic. Brighter Days, I think he's, he's brilliant. And I just think that so much could, so many people can gain so much from what you're doing. And from me personally, and everyone at Monkey Nut Audiobooks, like, we just wish you just an abundance of success. And if we can ever support you, 
we will. I don't say that very often, but I will because I really believe in what you're doing, which is great. Um, before we go, I was wondering, would you mind closing us down in a prayer? Then I'll I'll take over and just wrap it up. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right, thank you so much. Yeah, Father, thank you for everyone listening to this podcast and uh, wherever they are with faith. And uh, I pray, God, that they would know that they're not on their own mm. and that wherever they are, wherever they physically are listening to this right at the moment, I pray that there be a sense of you being with them mm. and uh, speaking to them and just loving them as well and helping them realize that how loved, how valuable and what an amazing contribution they have uh, made in the image of God, a divine image carrier. God bless them, we pray. Amen. Amen. And Father, just thank you for Patrick and the work that he's doing. I just pray that every public speaking that he does and Kintsugi Hope and the books, that they just reach people that may inspire them to sow a seed with other people. That it just expands and goes on so everyone can get what they individually need and that they know that and feel the presence of, of yourself over all of them. So just put your hand on all the work that they're doing. And Lord, the same for everyone listening to this podcast that they may just listen to Patrick's words today and just explore a little bit further. Um, even if it's just in a, a conversation with a friend or taking a, a step to someone they might know and just having that conversation that they may take that one step closer to the kingdom of heaven. So in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Be sure to join us on our social media and uh, share this with your friends. The, the more people we do rely on you guys sharing it. So please do that. And uh, we'll see you again real soon. God bless. Take care. Bye. You've been listening to the Outskirts of Faith podcast. We would love more people to join our community. So please subscribe, share this podcast and join us on our social media. And of course, you can visit our resource website at outskirtsoffaith.com. This podcast was edited by Chris Byland, the YouTube video editing by Adam Moss, music by Matthew Salvage and hosted by Elliot Frisby. The